Hi, and welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Jason Ben Shee, and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of the podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we'll have regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. But before I introduce our guest and topic for the day, allow me to introduce my co-host, Joelle Mitchell. How are you going today, Joelle? I'm well, Jason. I've had a big, two big cups of coffee, actually, so I'm, <laughs> I'm raring to go. And uh, when Joelle says big, her mugs are bigger than my hands put together. They are massive. <laughs> bigger than my face. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, no, she'll be on song today, no doubt. So um, look, I'd, I'd now like to introduce our guest for today. Uh, he's currently working at the New South Wales Regulator, Safe Work New South Wales, as a state inspector, and has been a key contributor to the development of the draft code of practice for psychological health at work. Welcome to the podcast, Ian Firth. Thank you. Great to have you here, mate. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Um, really looking forward to it. And it's, it's, um, it's great to see you both in the same room. Um, yeah, I was uh, saying to you off air, the last time I saw you dripping wet, having yeah. a ton of weight to a mental health conference in Sydney, uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, so it's good to see you and you're looking healthy and, and a lot drier. Things have been a lot drier for me recently, Jason. Yeah, compared to that particular morning. <laughs> Great. Now, yeah. So good to have you on. I know you're going to have a lot to share with us about you know, what's happening in New South Wales uh, and some of the really innovative and cool things that you're doing um, that is really country, if not um, you know, world leading. Yeah, um, we, uh, we're, I mean, all regulators have um, fairly passionate personnel uh, in this area. So um, I'm really looking forward to um, speaking about what we've been up to because it's been a fairly hectic few years for us in New South Wales. So, yeah. Yeah, terrific. Good stuff. Well, before we get into that, Ian, we're going to ask you a little bit of personal information, nothing too revealing, uh, but because we're a podcast, we like to ask our guests what types of podcasts they like to listen to. Yeah, I guess um, I, I'm, uh, I'm not um, trying to misrepresent myself, uh, given that we've only just started talking, but I have enjoyed your podcast recently. <laughs> um, oh, we'll keep this guy on, I think. Keep yeah. this guy on. <laughs> uh, have I passed? Do I get the easy questions now? Um, yeah, no, look, I have. I um, really enjoyed some of the comments. Um, Carlo's um, cake analogy was, you know, fantastic. Um, really love the way that he um, simplifies things for everybody. Um, outside that, um, you know, outside work, um, I enjoy podcasts that are probably, um, you know, more um, biographical um, and uh, I'm, I'm um, quite into my history, you know, so I like uh, podcasts and things on, um, well, one I've been uh, finished up listening to all over again uh, was on the uh, Mongolian Empire, um, Genghis Khan. And so, yeah, I'm a bit, uh, that's how I like to try and um, tune out from work, um, other than the family, of course, yeah. Yeah, sorry for uh, talking about too much work-related stuff on our podcast, mate, um, but I'm glad you tuned in. <laughs> That's all right. No, I've, I've really enjoyed it, as I said. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, tell us then about your professional career to date. Yeah, so um, I've got a psych background, a um, period of time as a clinical psychologist, um, and then uh, probably what kind of shift, you know, so I was um, doing a lot of work in um, occupational rehab, um, work injuries um, and also uh, workplace services like um, consulting for workplaces, uh, EAP provision. Um, and I, di I didn't really even realise that you know, um, psychology had a space in, in the kind of safety area and in that prevention area uh, until I got talking to a friend of mine who was also making a, um, a career transition out of the military. Um, and he was... Um, he was getting into uh, work health and safety and he was working for, uh, he was working in uh, aviation for um, an, an airline here in Australia. And he got talking to me about the um, psychologists that they work with. Uh, and then he got talking to me about um, human factors. So um, he said to me, I strong, strongly encourage you to um, have a look into it and learn a little bit more about it. So I did, I did some uh, short courses in uh, work health and safety and um, human factors uh, and was hooked. I mean, um, who doesn't want to work in the prevention space, um, you, you know? And so, uh, of course, the opportunity uh, was quite sought after to work for a regulator. And then, you know, when the opportunity came up to actually go as a um, go for a role as the specialist, um, like a social inspector, that uh, 
I'm still pinching myself that I made it through. But yeah, so that's how I ended up where I am. Yeah, it's um, it's a pretty special opportunity to be um, to be in that that type of a function in in the regulator where you're looking into those more sort of social systems of work um, rather than the engineering controls. And I think, um, yeah, speaking from a, from a similar background myself, it's really an area that we can um, as, as psychs or um, non-practicing psychs as it might be, um, you know, we can really provide that unique uh, perspective that, um, that is really needed when you're, when you're doing a comprehensive look at how, our systems of work are in place and, and whether they're effective or not and, um, you know, how things are reinforced and, and all of those types of, of elements. So, yeah, I think it's really important to have that skill set at a regulator. Yeah, definitely. And I think, um, you know, got a, a strong interest in um, research, you know, really enjoyed that part of my um, previous life and my studies. So um, that's an opportunity that we get plenty of um, here in the regulator, you know, to be involved in, at, a, um, at a, a certain level in um, research projects. And um, obviously uh, part of the role is to try and stay up to date with the latest um, research. So yeah, really value that side of it also. Yeah. yeah great. Well, um, you know, one of the things that we want to talk about as the core topic for today is the draft code of practice. Um, but before we get into that, I was wondering about some of your observations. Obviously, you go into a lot of workplaces as an inspector uh, and you talk to employers and you see what they're currently doing. So what are some of your observations about, you know, the ways that workplace mental health is commonly done or popularly done uh, versus how it should be done? I think, um, I think we see a lot of workplaces who are getting more comfortable um, and have a lot of systems in that kind of tertiary space or uh, in the recovery space. So, you know, I, I kind of think about it as um, before, during and after, and um, the integrated model calls it um, primary, secondary and tertiary. But there's obviously been uh, a lot of work done in the psych injury uh, space and um, having uh, systems to um, return people to work for both physical and um, psychological reasons. So, um, that's probably something that I'm seeing a little more of, you know, um, people are a little more confident and it's probably uh, a little more normal um, to be making sure that within your workplace that you've got those kind of tertiary systems. Um, there's still plenty of work for us to do in that area. Um, I think uh, in, I guess I'd, I'd also talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of the challenges that I think, um, we're seeing uh, as an inspector um, and I mean, you mentioned the code of practice um, and I'll talk a little bit about that soon, but um, one of the main reasons that we really got thinking about a code of practice was that um, we were getting a lot of feedback and some of the peer reviewed research um, supported this, that uh, people weren't really clear what they needed to do in that prevention space. Um, and so I think, uh, there's probably still a fair bit of work for us to do, um, industry and the regulator, in terms of um, helping with the systematic approach uh, and uh, integrating prevention for um, psychosocial hazards. In um, and of course, as the as the regulator, you know, one of the most common things that we see is when workplace behaviour is the hazard. Um, and, and, and that's probably um, a large amount of the referrals or the complaints, depending on which regulator you work for. Um, a large amount of the referrals come through are, are obviously for workplace behaviour. Um, so that's an area where, um, where we need to do a lot more work also. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can you talk to that for, for mm -hmm. a moment? Because um, I think there is some confusion about things like bullying and harassment and when does it become a, you know, occupational health and safety issue versus more of a, a fair work issue or a interpersonal type issue? Yeah, and that, that was a common theme that came up um, following our public our, um, public consultation for the draft code of practice. And it's probably one of the most common questions and scenarios that I get at presentations or um, workplace visits. So I, I guess there's a legal definition um, for uh, bullying. Um, and that's not found under the Work Health and Safety Legislative Framework. So that's where a lot of confusion um, can lie. Uh, and that definition is probably fairly widely known and that's captured in the guidance material. And it's um, 
repeated and unreasonable behaviour which can create a risk to your uh, health and safety. So, um, but there can obviously be types of workplace behaviour that are hazardous or harmful um, that don't necessarily meet that criteria or meet that threshold. Um, so it's the repeated and unreasonable part that we find a lot of businesses find challenging to try and interpret, you know, whether it has become a work health and safety issue. So I think, um, I think what we need to do is probably um, help people with their systems, help um, businesses and, and the workforce with their systems and with their training, um, understand it uh, really from a work health and safety lens, um, behaviour can be harmful. It doesn't need to meet that particular threshold legally, but behaviour can be harmful. And, you know, one of the areas of challenge, which I'm sure um, you would have heard through your podcast series so far, um, is that those sorts of issues that tend to be dealt with more in the people and culture or um, HR mm -hmm. domain. Um, and there's definitely a role for that. You know, that um, most workplaces will have a standard of behaviour. Most workplaces have codes of conduct. Uh, and when there's, a, when there's a breach of those standards and those codes, um, obviously someone needs to look into it. Um, but I think what's missing is that work health and safety lens. Um, and so probably what I'll talk about again a little later, which we're, you know, trying to clarify in our draft code um, is actually how to integrate some of that information into your work health and safety management system. Um, because uh, really we need people to be looking upstream in the prevention space. You know, we, we would hope that, um, I would hope that we can get to a point where we're starting to understand in a workplace, we're starting to understand a little more about what upstream causes might be leading to that behaviour. So in a lot of the situations that we respond to as inspectors, that sort of behaviour is the symptom, not the cause. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, we had uh, Dr. Re Rebecca Mahalak, uh, her episode came out today, uh, talking about sexual harassment and definitely um, you're voicing the same sort of uh, things that she is. You know, looking at the the you know the upstream stuff, looking at the higher order controls versus relying on policies uh, in order to prevent harm to people through those sort of behaviours. Absolutely, yeah. And it's when we talk hierarchy of control, um, we can sometimes get a reaction to, um, and and um, and and I can certainly understand why that the traditional hierarchy can't really be applied to psychosocial hazards. It, it doesn't fit, wasn't designed for it, you know, but, but we also hear that about the Work Health and Safety Act. Um, and, and there is there is some work for us to do in um, helping people apply the principles of that hierarchy um, because you can still apply the same principles. Yeah, yeah, no, we definitely use the uh, Total Worker Health Hierarchy of Controls from the CDC when, in our work, yeah. Okay, yeah. That much better match to uh, psychosocial hazards. Yeah, yeah, we've, we've got a few, you know, the, the, um, as regulators, we've kind of played around with a few ways of approaching it. Um, and I know uh, uh, Maureen Dollard has kind of um, released um, some suggestions on it. So um, that's on the to-do list for us, I think. Yeah, Maureen, if you're listening, uh, we'd love to have you on. And, uh, <laughs> and Ian might be able to you know, get in your ear and say, yeah, please come on and talk about psychosocial safety climate. So, yes. I can say some more wonderful things about Maureen if that would help. Um, <laughs> no, we'd, we'd love to have her on. We just like, we just need to schedule her in. That's all. Yeah, busy lady. Yeah. yeah, busy lady. Very. Uh, yeah. All right. So, um, Ian, maybe if you can take us through some of the um, the stats that sort of give an indication of the state of psychological health and safety in New South Wales. Yeah. So, um, I guess leading into the code of practice, we. You know, we were aware that um, something needs to be done. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of stats that have been floating around, particularly in the last kind of six to seven years. Um, some of the most well-known ones are the Priced Waterhouse Coopers uh, return on investment stats. Um, you know, but there's also um, regular information coming about out about um, compensation claims, the role that um, absenteeism and um, presenteeism has. Um, so here in New South Wales, recently uh, leading into the mentally healthy workplaces strategy, we were obviously quite interested in the data. Um, and we asked um, Professor Nick Lozier from the University of Sydney to help us with some um, 
up-to-date research on the current stats in New South Wales. Um, and then leading into the code of practice, uh, we also uh, had another look at the claims data here in New South Wales. And um, probably the, the, the figure that most people are taken by um, in the information that we've put out around the code of practice uh, is the increase in um, psychological claims compared to physical claims. So uh, in about the last five years, there's been an increase of um, 50, 53% in um, psychological claims compared to 3.5% um, in physical claims. There's a whole range of reasons why that, um, why that figure um, could be true. Uh, and, and, you know, the, that um, workplaces are causing... Uh, more harm to their workers is probably not the case. Um, so there's a whole um, whole bunch of other factors that actually um, go into that sort of data, as most of your listeners would know. You know, and that's about um, how decisions are made on claims, etc. Um, people are speaking up more. Um, so that was that was a um, a really uh, compelling um, data set for us. I guess the other data that we were really interested in was the the benchmarking tool survey. Um, so leading into the 2018 Mentally Healthy Workplaces strategy, um, we, implement, we, we developed um, a benchmarking tool. Um, the idea was that we wanted to measure the capability of businesses um, here in New South Wales in providing a mentally healthy workplaces. And we really wanted to develop something that we could measure the impact of the strategy and kind of measure progress um, here in New South Wales. So um, probably uh, uh, one of the other interesting figures that, that, that you may be um, uh, interested in is we, we developed um, five tiers uh, in collaboration with um, experts and uh, advocates here in New South Wales. We developed a matrix um, and then from that matrix, uh, five tiers of um, where businesses could possibly be at, you know, starting at the um, basic awareness level uh, and at the um, highest performing level, um, we call sustained and integrated um, approach. So what you've probably seen in the information that came out around the code of practice uh, was that when, when we went out to survey around um, 2,000 businesses here in New South Wales, about 8.8% of them um, felt that they were in that um, highest category where they had a, a sustained and integrated um, way of managing mental health. Uh, and what was unique about the benchmarking tool was that we were looking at, um, we weren't looking at um, uh, perceptions of, of stress. You know, we know that there are tools out there that do that, like the people at work tool. Um, but we were looking at uh, what sort of systems, what sort of processes um, does the workplace uh, use and how is it integrated? How do they make their decisions based on data, etc.? cetera? Um, so they're probably the two, I guess, um, pieces of data that most people have been asking us about. Okay. And so what, um, I guess, what can we conclude from that 8.8%? Um, yeah, well, I think, so um, if workplaces rated themselves in that um, integrated and sustained approach, they had mental health specific um, policies and procedures and strategies. Uh, they had um, initiatives that were tailored down to the work group size, not just at the organisational level or the individual level. Um, their actions were visible, they were continuous, they were using this sort of data to make their decisions. So I guess what, what we took from that is that um, less than 10% of the workplaces um, in that sample uh, rated themselves as um, really performing uh, at that um, optimal level. Um, it was a pretty even spread through the rest. Um, so that told us, I guess, what, how, how we interpreted that, um, that we had a bit of work to do. <laughs> Short answer, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and I think the other thing too, you know, which, which sort of um, relates to the code of practice um, and the work that the um, publications that uh, Safe Work Australia put out um, is that there really needs to be more of a focus on the systematic and um, preventative approach and workplaces probably need to know more about how to use their data to inform their decisions in this space. 
Yeah. So um, the, the other bit of data that you um, shared with, uh, with the code of practice or the draft code of practice when it came out was the comparison in workers' compensation claims for psychological injuries versus uh, physical injuries. And I thought that was a great comparison to make. Um, it seems like the health and safety profession has gotten pretty good uh, at managing uh, physical health and safety. It's pretty mature, uh, but it shows with that 9% stat and uh, the 53% stat. So uh, psychological injuries in increasing by um, uh, claims by 53% over four years, uh, it shows that there's a huge opportunity to make real step changes in, in protecting people's health and wellbeing. I think so. They, we were quite taken by that. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, the other thing that we were really taken by was that um, uh, data from the ABS, for example, um, indicates to us that there's a fairly high uh, uh, underreporting rate or, you know, there was um, back around um, 2014, 15. Um, so I guess we were thinking that that, that increase probably is starting to ref reflect a bit of a truer picture. Um, uh, you know, we can't conclusively say that that that, that increase is because of um, one or two factors, um, but you know we would hope that um, people are starting to recognise and be able to report more, um, and that they are getting the um, treatment that, that they need when work is is a factor in their um, psychological injury. Mm. So a lot of this research is coming out of the uh, New South Wales Mentally Healthy Workplaces Strategy. Um, so can you tell us a, a little bit more uh, broadly about that strategy? You know, what, what are the goals and, you know, what are, where are you at with the implementation of that strategy? Yeah, so uh, 2017, our, our minister at the time was really passionate about um, mental health um, and particularly in the workplace because that was his portfolio. Um, and he wanted, he wanted to get a snapshot of um, where New South Wales was um, and he wanted to, to develop, you know, um, wanted us to develop a, a, a benchmarking tool, as I mentioned, to try and measure, get a bit of a snapshot of, um, around where we are, try and measure how we're going. But also um, we, needed, we needed to work out um, what interventions, because Safe Work New South Wales and the rest of the New South Wales government, so it's a partnership with CIRA and ICARE, um, and it's a whole of government strategy. So we needed to work out if we were going to invest in certain um, interventions and support services for business, we needed to, to be sure that, that they were at least evidence informed, if not evidence based. Um, and that ideally there was a positive return on investment um, for those particular interventions. So um, we, we, uh, we, we got in touch with um, the University of Sydney, um, Professor Nick Lozier, um, with the support of um, Professor Sam Harvey from the Black Dog Institute, um, and a, a bunch of other experts, including Maureen, if you're listening, Maureen. Um, and, and we took a look at, um, you know, what interventions has a positive ROI? Uh, and then I guess from there, the strategy was really launched and uh, with, the data from the benchmarking tool around what industries um, appeared to need more help with their capability and what industries um, appeared to be performing more poorly, uh, we then rolled out some of the initiatives. So uh, some of the more well-known ones here in New South Wales, there was, uh, there was a high return on investment for um, manager mental health training, for example. Um, so that was one of the services that we rolled out. Um, across the state and we particularly wanted to, to target small and medium-sized business um, because not surprisingly some of the data indicated that they needed a bit more help with the capability. Mm. Um, so the strategy, we're at the midway point now for the, for the strategy. It's being reviewed at the moment um, and there'll be some updated information coming out in, um, in the next month or two. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, be a mid-strategy review point and um, I'm really excited about uh, what they're going to tell us about the benchmarking in particular. Yeah. Yeah, terrific. Okay. Um, so can we move on and talk about the, the code of practice um, that you guys have developed then? Um, what was the, the motivation for developing that code of practice? Yeah, so I think um, along with the data that we've mentioned, you know, the um, claims data, um, 
and some of the data from the benchmarking tool um, and the mentally healthy workplaces strategy, we were also aware of some of those um, peer reviewed journal articles that have been around for over 10 years now that have been telling us that the regulatory framework or the legislative framework um, isn't applied um, as well and as frequently to psychosocial hazards as what it is to the physical hazards. So, um, you know, in that research, there was um, the perception from a whole range of different roles and um, professions that the Work Health and Safety Act um, and the framework really isn't set up um, to work well for um, psychosocial hazards. So that was the first thing that we've been aware of for some time. The Act defines health as physical and psychological health. Um, and then it moves on to those kind of broader duties. Um, and while we know, we might know that those broader duties are certainly um, applicable to psychosocial hazards and we can work out um, how to apply them. Um, there was still some confusion and some, some doubt. Um, so that was really probably the final piece of the puzzle for us. And we took a look at, um, at the uh, legislative framework. Um, so at the top of the legislative framework, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that kind of four-tiered pyramid. At the top of the framework, you have your uh, Work Health and Safety Act, uh, which sets out those broad duties, really important duties, particularly for psychosocial hazards, the consultation. Um, everyone and, and we can we can um, talk a little bit about that later but it's got the primary duties you know it's got the business duty and it's got the officers duties really powerful pieces of the act when you um, when you apply them to psychosocial hazards um, things can change so at that top tier is the work health and safety act broad duties and then for the other hazards the second tier down is the regulations and that really starts to clarify um, for a lot of hazards like diving and noise etc um, exactly what's required in terms of the risk management process um, to meet your duties uh, under, under the Work Health and Safety Act. Uh, and then that third tier is um, standards and codes of practice, mainly codes of practice. And then the fourth tier is the guidance um, material. So for psychosocial hazards, you know, we've got a definition in the Act about um, health does include psychological health, and we've got those broad duties. And then we don't really have anything until we get down to the guidance. So even though the guidance material doesn't tell us anything different to what a code of practice would or what the regulations would, there was still some confusion and I guess um, a little uncertainty out there in, in, in relation to can, can you just tell me what, what, you, what you want me to do and what I need to do legally, tell me where to start. Um, tell me how to be compliant. Um, so we felt that probably um, the best way for us to answer those sorts of concerns uh, was to look at a code of practice because the purpose of a code of practice, ideally, well, sorry, um, primarily, is to indicate for people um, how to comply with their duties under the legislation. Yeah. Okay. Um, so sort of um, developed in the absence of the um, the regulations, I guess, um, is that the normal pattern that, that would follow or would there normally be the regs um, first and then you develop the code after that? Yeah, look, I don't, there's, there's certainly other codes, um, quite a few of them that have been uh, developed without specific mention in the regulations. So um, it's not against the norm to start to work on a code of practice. Um, I guess we're aware that uh, coming out of the Boland review, there was a recommendation um, that hasn't been discussed yet at, at the national level. Um, so that was a, a, a separate process to what we might look at um, he, here in New South Wales. And um, we need to respect that process and let it run its course. Um, so yeah, and I wouldn't say it was um, out of the ordinary because uh, they, again, the other message that um, a lot of people probably aren't clear on is that the regulations in a code of practice actually serve two different purposes. So it's more like they complement each other and they're an extension of each other rather than one replaces the other. Yeah, and I suppose um, it's a lot more expedient to get out that code of practice to, to provide people with that guidance that they're seeking rather than waiting for the, the sometimes very long process that is legislative change. Yeah, that's it. And, 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 you know, by developing a code of practice, we're not adding any new duties. Um, we're not um, increasing um, the demands on businesses. We're not 
um, giving people more obligations. We're just trying to clarify as practically as we possibly can um, how to comply with the Work Health and Safety Act. And it isn't mandatory. Go to practice isn't mandatory here in New South Wales. Mm. So what stage are you at with the Code of Practice now? So we went out to public consultation in October, November. Um, quite a long consultation period because, um, well, partly because we knew that people um, people are quite busy <laughs> in general, um, but also because this was an area that we, we really wanted to give everybody the opportunity to provide some sort of comment on um, because there's so many different opinions out there and I guess so much confusion, um, you know, stakeholders tell me, particularly when I go to a workplace, that they've, you know, been on Google and typed in um, mentally healthy workplaces and they're overwhelmed by all the information. Um, and, you know, we know that not all of it is, is even evidence informed and um, certainly it's not clear, stakeholders tell me anyway, it, it, it isn't clear um, how to interpret their uh, legal obligations from all that information. Um, so we went out with an extended consultation period and we heard lots of great feedback um, around that draft code. We went out with a version that was pretty similar to the Safe Work Australia National Guide because we've been getting a lot of positive comments about the National Guide. Um, so we really focused on the prevention space as, as the Work Health and Safety Regulator, whereas the guide looks at the, the primary, secondary and tertiary phases, looks at the recovery uh, phase also. Um, and uh, we've just been through um, been through all that information from the public consultation and worked out, you know, for example, what's in scope of a code of practice and what isn't. Um, and we've been, we're at the process of um, consulting with uh, some of our legal and policy and uh, subject matter um, experts to work out what the new version, what, what the new draft version might look like. Um, I can tell you it's a lot more practical. Um, we needed New South Wales to help us uh, make a lot of decisions on um, what to include and what was going to be more helpful. Um, yeah, so that's where we're at. And what was the what was the feedback like? Any trends of the types of feedback that you received? Yeah, there was. There was some pretty common themes. You know, one of the one of the big ones that I can probably um, talk about today is the um, title. You know, we we um, we went out with a pretty generic. We felt title, uh, which was around managing risks to psychological health, um, and we use that term because that's how the legislation defines it. Um, but we, we actually got um, some feedback that that was uh, stakeholders were um, a little anxious about this, the scope of risks to psychological health. Um, and they're a little concerned that um, it, it, it needed to be clearer that this is just work related. Um, that, you know, that was something else that we're really conscious of with the code of practice is we want to show businesses how to comply um, with their work health and safety obligations for work related um, psychosocial hazard. So uh, that was probably one of the main ones. So um, we've had a rethink about the title and tried to bring it back to the hazard more. Um, we got some some comments on, we set out, I guess, like, like in the National Guide, we set out to try and explain the mechanism of injury, um, you know, through the um, stress reaction. Um, and of course that, you know, some people found that really useful. But as you would know, when you talk about stress, um, it's perceived differently by a lot of different people and it can be confusing um, depending on what term you use. Um, so we ended up bringing that based on the feedback, we ended up um, bringing the focus well and truly back on the hazard um, and not providing too much information about the mechanism of, of, of injury or the injury itself. Uh, we got a lot of um, we got a lot of comments and some, um, some positive comments um, around uh, how we were trying to tackle the issue of performance management, reasonable management action, reasonable adjustments. Big one, uh, always has been a big issue and, all, and probably will be for some time. Um, and it's a challenge for us because we look after the Work Health and Safety Act um, and those terms really fall under other pieces of legislation. So uh, we got a lot of comments from our stakeholders around that scenario that involves uh, all those other pieces of legislation. The, the classic, you know, I've got a worker that's coming back to work with a mental illness or with mental ill health. Uh, I'm not convinced that it's, that it's all work related. In fact, I, I, I think it's, um, definitely some of it's coming from their home life. Um, they're not performing and I have to think about performance management um, and in you know, what do I need to consider? Um, 
so that's a really complex scenario that we're trying to provide as much guidance as we can on the work health and safety obligations for a scenario like that. Um, we also got some feedback, I guess, um, pretty clear feedback that um, stakeholders, we, we intended to kind of develop a suite of underlying um, facts and um, guidance to flesh out more on these issues of um, reasonable adjustment, uh, any discrimination, et cetera. Um, and we got some, some really valuable feedback that, um, you know what, um, if it's important to us, if, if it's that important, just um, put it in the one location. Um, so um, give us one document that we can read and be really clear on what our obligations are because we don't have time to go looking in that underlying suite of tools and resources unless we absolutely have to, you know, unless something's going wrong. Um, we also got some, I, I guess, positive feedback on what we were trying to do with um, work design and how to explain systems um, and um, how to record and respond to um, psychosocial hazards within the workplace and how to fold it into your safety management system. Um, so we've actually worked on that even more since that original draft and tried to make that um, more practical. Uh, and of course, the big one is um, case studies. Uh, um, the feedback appreciated uh, our attempt to provide templates and, and tools that workplaces could use, found it very helpful. Um, but, but they also said to us, um, can you populate those tools with some case studies and show us how to use it? So they, they're, they're probably the main, um, main themes that, that came through, yeah. Nothing surprising and really exciting from my perspective to hear all that, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like you've had some really good engagement then um, from the stakeholders. So that's really what you want when, you, when you're going out for public consultation. You want people to actually get into it and, and give you some really useful feedback so that you can um, have that, that document that's going to be as beneficial as possible for the, um, for the end user. Oh, the, look, that's exactly right. Um, you know, the, the whole purpose of this is so that um, businesses and workers can pick it up and understand in really clear, practical terms um, you know, I, I kind of think about it um, as an inspector and, and it might sound a bit corny, but um, a, a document like this will give me as an inspector the opportunity to literally be on the same page as, as the business. You know, we can turn to it. Uh, we can go through it together. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've certainly had, um, yeah, that sort of similar experience myself where when you've got the guidance already published that, that you can refer to as an inspector, then it does just make it that much easier to to talk through um, with with whoever it is that you're inspecting. Absolutely. And it, it makes it a little more meaningful when it's a code compared to guidance. So, you know, mm -hmm. it, we're, um, we're really hoping that that will help. Yeah. yeah. So what are the next steps then for the code? Yeah, so next step, um, we've got to uh, finish going through all that feedback, as I said, and go through our internal processes um, and uh, finish consulting with our experts around some of the technical um, decisions that, that we're making. Um, and then we'll um, probably go back out, um, speak to some of the stakeholders um, who were concerned about parts of the original draft, um, let them know um, what decisions we've made, why we've made those decisions. Um, and then we come back when we're happy with that, you know, final draft, uh, then it's very much out of ha our hands and it um, goes into the, um, goes through the um, governmental processes. So um, we just do our bit here and, and, and I guess um, bring together everything that we've got and make sure it's practical, um, make sure that it's, it's, it's correct and that it, that it indicates what we as a regulator want to see. Um, and then uh, where it goes after that is really up to, um, to our political leaders, yeah. Yeah, funnily enough, um, you started uh, or you released your draft code of practice about the same time as the draft ISO 45003 standard came out. Um, would you mind just briefly talking about maybe the difference in the, in the two approaches and what sort of companies might you refer to what what kind of guidance? Yeah, so we, um, we were really grateful to have um, Carlo's input um, mm. as a uh, one of our experts that's that's been um, working with us through the process has been very generous, um, and I think uh, where the ISO standard um, kind of uh, continues as a child standard to forty five thousand and and one as the parent standard, um, we felt there was still 
there was still a role for a code of practice here in New South Wales to play sitting under 45,003 um, that really stepped out in, in more practical terms. So 45,003, um, the way I see it, really lets um, larger organisations know uh, what to integrate into their system. Hmm. Um, it's got a different way of classifying the psychosocial hazards to what we have. Um, I, I don't think it, it contradicts, um, our, our, our code co contradicts the way that um, 45003 conceptualises their psychosocial hazards. But we had a decision um, here in Australia. There's, there's, there's a few different ways that we can um, define and list our hazards and um, categorise them. You know, they can be social factors um, like uh, 45003 um, or uh, here in Australia, we found... In addition to feedback through the public consultation process, we found that we really needed to pick um, an Australian um, research-based way of um, defining and listing psychosocial hazards. So we went with what was found in the People at Work project, um, and we've we've um, we've been as consistent as possible um, with the terminology that they use. Um, because that is, you know, one of the few Australian uh, research projects looking at um, psychosocial hazards. Um, other differences with 45,003, I, th I think they were the, the, the main ones that really jumped out at me. I mean, 45,003 can go a little beyond what a code of practice is designed for. Um, and it can talk about um, worker participation, um, competence, things like that. And we're really restricted under the Work Health and Safety Act that the purpose of a code is to show people how to comply with the Act. Um, so we couldn't go as as broad as um, 45,003. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, my, my thinking is it's probably going to be your larger multinationals who are looking for consistency, um, you know, with a global employee population uh, that will probably adopt things like ISO more closely than, say, the Code of Practice. Uh, but like you say, the code of uh, ISO 45003 has uh, probably the same baseline, if you like, yeah. as the code, but then has some extra things to be able to adopt the standard. So like you said, uh, as long as companies are meeting the code of practice as a minimum, um, then that's what you're really after. That's it. You know, when we're all talking about um, the uh, risk management process, you know, mm. the, the, at the core of all of these things, 45,003 and the National Guide and the Canadian process, that, it's that um, risk management process that really sits at the core of it. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, Joel and I are really excited about all the different things that are happening, both you know, in New South Wales and Australia, globally, around psychological health and safety at work. And obviously, that's what prompted us to produce this podcast to get this information out there. So um, given that you've been working in this space for quite a while now, and obviously a really big advocate for psychological health at work, uh, what are some of your uh, aims or aspirations for the way that mental health at work is, is changes in the future or improves? I think I, th I think I'd probably um, I'd probably talk about two kind of um, two kind of categories in answering that. Um, you know, one is the science. I, I'd, um, I'm really enjoying some of the research that's being done. Um, really love to see, you know, we've got plenty of research on the hazards and uh, psychosocial hazards and psychosocial risks. Um, it would be really, I think, um, it's exciting to research start to look into um, interventions um, or, you know, to use the work health and safety language control measures because that's a, it's a bit of a challenge in the psychosocial hazard space as a regulator um, a lot of uh, people just want us to give them a list of control measures and tell, um, hand it to them so they can then go away and start to implement those control measures. But uh, when you're talking psychosocial hazards, um, having a generic list off the shelf um, isn't effective. So we're really talking about the um, process behind how businesses um, come up with their control measures. You know, we, we mentioned the um, hierarchy previously. Um, work design is such an important part of that. Um, so I'd really like to see, I guess, in the science space, um, really looking forward to the research that will be coming out around work design and the interventions within a workplace and what works for who. Um, in terms of practice, uh, I guess, you know, I'd, I'd love to see uh, psychosocial hazards um, talked about and understood 
um, as comfortably as what physical hazards are at the moment. Um, you know, and 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 where uh, hazardous manual tasks, for example, and um, musculoskeletal injuries, uh, where they're at now, didn't just happen overnight. So you know, I think I think um, I think I'm really looking forward and, and hoping that we're kind of um, on the same journey. Um, I guess. Uh, I'd really love to see data informing more decisions and being entered more into the safety management systems in the psychosocial hazard space. Um, one of the common scenarios and, and concerns that's often raised with me as an, as an inspector is when I talk to businesses about how to use their uh, HR data, um, you know, um, grievances, complaints. Um, I think I'd, I'd like to see us get to a point where we can understand that that, that actually can be um, really valuable uh, work health and safety information. And there's, look, there's a, there's a lot of workplaces that I visit where their um, uh, HR team and their work health and safety team and their injury management team actually operate separately. Um, and they're operating under procedures where sometimes they actually can't share information. Um, so I'd really like to see that change. I think uh, there is a way that you can share um, information around the psychosocial hazards without breaching confidentiality and identifying people. So um, I guess I'd, I'd, I'd love to see us understanding more about work design, you know, and um, how to apply that to psychosocial hazards, given that that's moving further up the um, top of the hierarchy process. Hmm. Um, getting in early and designing out what you can. Um, yeah, that's probably... It's only a small list. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to lead it back, uh, read it back, and then maybe um, yeah, in five years' time we can look and see how many of your predictions came true. And <laughs> was, I do. yeah, yeah I'd, um, I'd also like a Hummer, but 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 you know that's probably like a big uh, Humvee to drive around. Um, but that's probably uh, not exactly what you're after. So probably a bit impractical to get around Sydney and see. Definitely, <laughs> it's hard enough as it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, look, certainly um, a lot of what you're saying there resonates with what um, some of our other guests have, have talked about as well. And I think, um, you know, in, in particular that um, the importance of tailoring those control measures to to the psychosocial hazards that are present in your particular workplace. So, you know, it is really going to be unique to your workplace. Um, we were speaking with Dia Day and she was saying that, you know, the consultation piece um, that she did with with a group of um, of the workforce actually identified an IT control measure as being the most appropriate um, control for that particular psychosocial hazard. Um, so, but you wouldn't get that without the consultation, and you're not going to get that in in a typical, you know, a standard list of control measures. So, that um, that piece on consultation with the workforce really, you know, it's always been important. But in this the psychosocial risk space, it's just absolutely vital um, that we get that good quality consultation with the workforce and that we're not just, um, you know, getting a, um, a token representative into the risk assessment to sort of say, yes, we did it. Um, you need to get that really good, rich um, information from them to, to guide um, what are going to be the best solutions. Yeah, absolutely. The, you know, Consultation mechanisms are such a huge part of the act and the regulations, you know, so even legally it's so important. Um, but when you're talking about psychosocial hazards and the impact on the workforce, um, you know, you can do your surveys and you can have a look at your data, but to a degree you're really uh, making assumptions, you know, around what you need to do and what, what might be going wrong, you know. Um, the stress reaction is such an individual thing, you know, it can... Uh, it, 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 um, really comes down a lot to the way that we appraise whether we can cope with these situations or not as an individual worker. Um, so unless you're really consulting and trying to understand how people are appraising the resources that they have available versus the demands on them, um, you're really doing a bit of guesswork there. Um, and we, you know, we're not expecting workplaces to be stress-free. If, if you've got a stress-free workplace, you've got all sorts of other problems um, before you need to deal with work health and safety, like um, production, for example. So um, we're not expecting workplaces to be stress-free. Um, things like performance management and re returning back to work for the worker and the frontline manager, they're stressful situations, and it's not realistic to expect that they won't be um, potentially stressful situations. So I... I guess the other thing in, in the control measures space, 
you know, we also don't expect um, managers and eg executives to be psychologists. So that's, that's a comment that I often hear is, you know, well, um, are you now telling me that I need to be a psychologist? And um, absolutely not. Uh, hopefully the publications like the um, National Guide and the Code of Practice will um, clarify that. Uh, and in that control measure space, um, as you said, it, it really more beneficial. Um, I guess we'd really like to see more people taking a look at the work group level um, intervention. So, you know, if you've got some hazards that might be emerging or might be in place in a particular work group, it doesn't mean that you need to implement changes across your organisation. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you different different work groups will have different um, different hazard exposures. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and as you said, some of the solutions or, you know, the actions or, or the control measures um, can be quite reasonable. And, and, um, but you won't know until you really uh, sit down and um, take a deeper dive with your workers. Yeah, absolutely. So that probably leads us into our final question for you today, Ian. What are your parting words of wisdom for professionals who would like to work in this field of psych health and safety? Um, We'd really love to see you join the regulator. <laughs> <laughs> you might edit that part out. Um, I think for people working in the area of, of um, work health and safety, I guess um, my parting words would be that, you know, most of you are probably familiar with the business case now, um, but, you know, rest assured there is a business case. There's some, there's some ROI data. Um, and, and um, work health and safety does have a role to play in managing psychosocial hazards and it needs to be more involved, um, if not sit more with the work health and safety process than any other part of the business. Um, I'd, I'd certainly encourage work health and safety pr professionals to work on uh, having their role um, integrated into those other management systems. Um, and probably uh, try and have more of an influence in the design and the management of work. Uh, and I guess one of the practical ones, um, you, you can source data from your HR and your workers' compensation teams without being given identifying or private or health-related information. Um, and you're probably the best person in the organisation having a work health and safety lens. Uh, you're probably one of the best people in the organisation to be looking at that data. Excellent advice. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, well, um, Ian, you've uh, unloaded a lot of really great information on us. Um, kudos to you and your team for, um, you know, putting in that extra effort and putting in the, the, the out the draft and getting so much consultation done, which uh, is obviously going to lead to a much better product at the end of the day that is just going to be so much more useful for the end users. So uh, well done to you and your team. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. It's um, always really grateful to be speaking about uh, what we do and um, trying to get the messages out there. Well, we may have you on again uh, sometime, Ian. So um, <laughs> that'd be great. I've, yeah. We'd love to get an update from you at a later stage. Really appreciate it. Yeah, great. So um, that brings us to the end of the episode, folks. So thanks so much for for tuning in. Uh, don't forget, we videotape all of these. And that shows my age a bit, I think, but uh, we record these things and we put them <laughs> on YouTube later on the Flourish DX channel if you want to check out uh, that, that there. Um, you can also uh, follow myself or Joel or connect with us over LinkedIn. Uh, Ian's a pretty fr friendly guy as well. He'd probably uh, accept your uh, connection requests if you're a like-minded professional. And, um, you know, so do make sure that if you um, do want to see Colin Firth's um, more handsome uh, relative, uh, Ian, uh, do check out the clips that we put on the Flourish GX channel on LinkedIn as well. But uh, thanks again, everyone, and we'll catch you next episode.